instead of sacrificing, make compromises, small little changes. So for instance, you know, if someone says I'm going for a social event, will I reduce calories really, really low for the whole week and then have my social event? I'm like, well, no, we can pull down a little bit, but instead of your cocktails or your wine and beer, why don't we have a spirit and a zero calorie mixer? That was fat loss coach Sarah Catterson talking about the power of making compromises, not sacrifices, especially when it comes to your nutrition and your fat loss goal. In today's podcast, we go deep on all things weight loss, fat loss. Sarah is somebody who I'm so happy to see having positively exploded on social media over the last few months. She's a great person. I'm doing a little bit of work with her boyfriend, Anto, who we mentioned in this podcast as well. He's on one of my business courses at the minute. And Sarah is just crushing it with content online. And we sing from a very similar hymn sheet when it comes to nutrition, sustainability, and making sure that you're doing the right things on the front end. And in today's podcast, we talk about her backstory, her weight loss story, about going from one extreme to the other and overcoming that body discomfort and mild body dysmorphia that she had. We also talk about making weight loss okay again in the wake of the body positivity movement and improving our body composition and how confidence that you get from that is a really good thing. We also go through fat loss supplements, ones to avoid, ones to include, eating healthy but not losing weight, and everything in between. So without further ado, here is today's podcast with fat loss coach Sarah Catterson on dieting phases, losing weight without restriction, and the power of making compromises, not sacrifices. Enjoy. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the podcast. I'm delighted to be joined today with my guest, Sarah Catterson. Sarah is an online coach who helps women lose weight without restriction. She is the host of the podcast, In an Imperfect World, and the creator of the SCC coaching app, where she helps people become the strongest versions of themselves, physically and mentally. I'm looking forward to talking all things fitness, nutrition, and weight loss in today's show. Sarah, welcome to the podcast. Brian, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. I'm buzzing for this chat today. Oh, me too. Sarah, I, I said right before we went on air, I saw the early days of your content because you've exploded on social media now Instagram in particular and you're serving so many people in such a great way with educational content cutting through all the misinformation but I remember the early days when you were starting off and it was a case of just keep going with the content please and you did and now you are as I mentioned impacting hundreds of thousands of people in a positive way and before we start to unpack some of those mistakes that people make some of those nutritional misconceptions that are out there when it comes to fat loss and weight loss talk to us a little bit about your backstory and what kind of what got you into the space because I think it ties in very nicely with the community you serve currently yeah absolutely well yeah that's what we were just chatting about there that it, it blew up before that it's such a full circle moment because I remember writing to you being like right, I'm going to write to Brian and see if he'll come on my podcast. But like, I know he won't reply. Like he has so many followers. And I had this thing in my head that people with followers like literally sat in these castles and didn't work. And they just had all these followers and that's when you've made it. And when you get followers, you realize you actually work 10 times fucking harder. But it's just mad being on the podcast because I was, you know, so excited to get you on mine. And it's just so good to be able to come on and chat, hopefully to reach a lot of other women. But yeah, so I, throughout my childhood teens, I, you know, had the puppy fat and would get the odd comment of, it's just puppy fat. And I was always that girl who was very self-conscious. I was, I hated sports, but I did everything. I tried everything. I dipped my toes into football, basketball, uh, hockey. I did horse riding and my parents now, now that I'm an adult, I feel so bad for them because I'd like I'd say to them, right, I'm doing horse riding and they'd go out and get me all the gear. Now that I'm an adult, I know that shit's expensive and I'd last a week and I'd drop out. So that was how everything went. I hated anything that was to do with fitness and I just fell into the trap of I was built this way. I'm never going to lose weight. So what's the point? So I never looked after my nutrition. I gained quite a lot of weight. I had no fitness, really unhealthy and do you know, I only posted a, a photo the other day of a before and after just kind of explaining my journey on Instagram because it has blown up and I don't think many people know my own journey. And a lot of people commented and said, well, I don't think your before photo was heavy enough to say that you were heavier. And that actually made me really want to talk about it even more because you don't have to be morbidly obese to be uncomfortable, um, self-conscious, unhealthy, unhappy, unfit to you know you don't have to be to a stage that it's it's you know needing to go for medical help 
so that was one thing. I wasn't by any means obese, but from there on, I decided to get a coach and I just decided I wanted to completely make changes. So I lost about 13 kg, but I went from getting all these compliments or not getting compliments. I was called, you know, bigger fat. I was called big boned, all of those names to then getting compliments of you look incredible. You look so lean um, that it was like a drug. I wanted more. I wanted more. So I kept going and I kept losing weight. I didn't care um, about, you know, health or anything. I just wanted to stay that size because I was so scared of gaining weight again that I then lost way too much weight. I was focused on the scales. L- looking back, I just want to give that girl a little hug because she had lost so much weight but couldn't even see it. I look back at photos now and I even said to Anton the other day, my partner, how, how did you not know? And he was like, I was with you every day that I didn't even see it. And I'll never forget, my mom even said she she came over and visited me and she just said she went home in the airport and she just like said to my dad, you know, she was just devastated and so upset that she didn't know how to explain it to me. So luckily I then, you know, my eyes opened and I realized I don't need to be either side. I can be bang smack in the middle. And I focused on building muscle, you know, gaining some extra weight in a healthy way. And over the last couple of years, I've just really focused on no restriction, a balanced lifestyle. If I want to go out for a few drinks with friends, I will. If I want to have a pizza, I will. But I also really work hard. I train hard. I focus hard. I focus on my health and fitness. And I don't want to be that really lean girl. And I don't want to be the bigger girl. And now I get to help ladies on both sides. So in a way, I'm rambling now, but in a way, my experience, I'm so glad I was on the both sides so that I can help all women going through everything. Sarah, with the, I think body discomfort is probably the best language to put on that because it's yeah. not full-blown body dysmorphia. It's it, it's but body discomfort. And I get this from the male perspective. I had this for years through my 20s, which is so ironic because people tend to have preconceptions, like you said, that your before photo is not heavy enough or for me, it doesn't happen with men or it doesn't happen with males. And I had that full-blown body discomfort into body dysmorphia in my sight. And I found it really tricky to get out of it initially, the zero to one. I remember leaving the bodybuilding competitive world and fitness modeling, moving gyms so that I was in a new circle of people, taking mirrors out of my bedroom, not listening to any more fat loss or muscle building related podcasts or YouTube channels for a period of time. And my zero to one, although difficult in hindsight, took me several months. What was your initial journey like because that body discomfort and I this is a bit of a controversial opinion that I have that I seem to get pushed back on with other fitness people that self-love and self-acceptance is the foundation at which your weight loss or fat loss or body composition is built like it doesn't matter if you feel terrible about yourself and you don't accept yourself and you don't love yourself you might lose weight you might get bigger in terms of building muscle or losing body fat but you might still not be happy now i think you need to look at that self love and that self acceptance as the foundation pillar at which everything else is built how did you go from that 0 to 1 in that initial phase because i think anyone listening who has a body composition goal weight loss fat loss toning up building muscle etc they need to understand that the order matters here that it's important what did that transition look like for you in the early days just for anyone that's at a similar starting point now yeah so when I was on the heavier side, that initial phase was I had just kind of hit rock bottom. You know, I was I was getting to a stage of like, you know, people in my house would go to sleep and then I'd go downstairs and start eating because I was so unhappy in myself. I didn't really want people around me seeing that. And then once I got to that stage, it was just a case of I've nothing to lose. If If I don't get to you know the I I used to have wallpapers on my phone or screenshots on my phone of women I wanted to look like now these women were complete models that are beautiful women but women that I would not aspire to look like now because I focus on a different physique and but at the time it was just you know wanting to look like someone so it was a case of just trying to change my mindset that if I don't get there that's fine but I want to just feel better so I just started to take small little steps but then once I started to take those small little steps I realized oh my god it's nothing to do with what I meant to look like I actually am gonna feel amazing it was when I started training it's so 
it was just the most amazing feeling ever waking up rested waking up wanting to feel my best that day rather than dragging myself out of bed and as I said that then got to an addictive stage and I went too far and when I got to the other stage of being too lean I then admittedly got a coach because I wasn't a coach at that stage and that helped me needing and I actually think that stage can I'm I'm not gonna say harder because I know people losing weight is very difficult but I do think mentally it can be quite difficult for girls having to gain weight because that's a scary place especially if it if they've been heavier and um, but just on the self-acceptance thing there I actually think there's two sides of this and it was only yesterday I was chatting to my WhatsApp group of ladies and one lady popped in and she said I'm struggling with the fact that everyone keeps saying I need to love my body but I am going away during the summer and I would like to lose some weight but I feel like I'm not even allowed because people keep going on about loving yourself and I explained to her that it's okay if you want to lose a little bit of body fat before going away or or if you have a, a goal or just a time frame in mind that is okay if it's done in a healthy way and you know you're not going on holiday dragging your heels you're not dieting up until the point you get in the plane and then you start overeating when you get abroad it's absolutely fine to not feel comfortable and want to lose a little bit of weight you know even though I'm a coach right now and I'm all about you have to you know accept where you are and work on where you are that I'm I'm in a diving phase at the moment because I want to make some changes that I've been at my leanest but unhappiness up unhappiest so it's kind of that 50 50 that you know you you need to I suppose love your body I'm not a huge what, what was that kind of not trend but body the, positivity yeah I'm not I'm not massive into that because I do I do think that you know, you have to work hard and there can be times that you do want to diet or there's time that you do want to focus on muscle growth and that you're not, you're not always going to feel your best, especially as females with hormones all over the place, like a roller coaster. You're not always going to have that body positivity and it can almost put more pressure on you because you're feeling like I have to love my body. The thing with the body positivity movement, I feel it's the real baby getting thrown out with the bathwater. I think in its original form, it took some of that pressure off and I was like you, the fitness model photos, the model photos and be like aspiring to look like this person who is completely different genetic makeup to you, potentially dieted strictly for that photo that you have as a screensaver on that day and that's their absolute best that they're looking and you're trying to look like that on a daily basis. This is what I did. And with the body positivity movement, it shifted it back a little bit to look, you can love yourself and that's an amazing thing to do, self-acceptance. But I also feel it's gone completely the other side now where, as you said, when you have women in a WhatsApp group or men or anyone going, well, actually, I kind of feel like I shouldn't want to lose weight now or I shouldn't want to tone up. Of course, you should want to improve. There's nothing wrong. Like Life is a dynamic thing that's moving all the time. And we're not saying that you can't love yourself and self-accept yourself and not want to lose weight at the same time. You can 100% do both of those things. What we're trying to say here, and I, again, if I'm singing from the same hinge sheet, Sarah, let me know or if it's you think differently. What we're saying is you the how you do it is important, like getting on the plane and not overeating and binging because you've restricted so much in the lead up to a holiday or the I'll be happy win fallacy that I'll be happy when I lose 10 pounds or 15 pounds or 20 pounds. There's no guarantee you will be. How you do it's important. The confidence you did, the person you had to become in the process all matters greatly. Do you, what's your thoughts on that, Sarah, when it comes to the making it okay for people to want to lose weight which is, sounds mental in 2024 that we feel like we have to give people permission yeah. to change their body composition for the way they want to but that's the way things have gone yeah i might get in trouble for this one and it's not i never bash other people but i do sometimes think that people who don't want to lose weight themselves are then pushing that on others that can be quite difficult because people can watch that and think oh, okay well you know losing weight is bad well you know it's not bad if it's done in a um correct way and a way that it's not going to damage your body your health your mindset but also if you are someone who doesn't want to lose weight that's fine you know it's just focusing on yourself and if you do want to lose weight then you know I'll often get a lot of clients come to me straight away especially if they start the eight-week challenges and they'll say in the eight weeks one is 10 kg 
and I'll say to them, okay, that is an amazing goal to have, but you could lose four kg and feel absolutely amazing. But because you've told yourself you want to lose 10 kg, that four, it will be nothing. You won't even, when you look in the mirror, you won't be happy with what you see because you're still wondering where that six kg can be lost. And that was me. I could have, you know, kept on three or four kg more, but because I had a number in my head, I kept going. And that's when I became unhappy. And Anto was actually laughing at me the other day. He was saying, you're so stubborn of what other people say to you and you always try to prove people wrong. And it's not that I do things for others, but when I was heavier, I remember I got messages. This was before I was with Anto. I was, I was about 15, but I got messages off um, a guy saying, who ate all the pies? And I actually have that screenshot. And then when I lost all of my weight, someone commented on my video. I was only starting out to be a coach and some man commented on my video being like, you wouldn't know if you're standing front or back because I had lost so much weight. I was literally like a pencil. And then it was only last week I posted a photo and I couldn't be happier at the moment. I've gained a lot of muscle and I really put, you know, so much hard work in and I'm really trying to show women that you can be strong. And a woman commented on my photo being like, you look like a man, you've gone too far, you're way too muscly. And I just had a moment, I was like, well, first off, that's probably the best compliment I've ever had. But you actually will never please everyone, anyone. And I know people listening to this are not going to potentially be coaches and they're not looking for validations off others. Neither am I with people online. But, you know, you're we're always going to have things being said, whether you're this or that. And I just said to myself, do you know what? I've been bigger. I've been leaner. I've been at, at this now and every single stage I've been at, I've got hate. And if you bring it to yourself, you're probably going to criticize yourself at every single stage. So if you're someone now losing weight, you're probably not thinking it's good enough. If you're someone's building muscle, you're thinking, why is it taking so long? We're, we're always going to be critical on ourselves. And that's where I think that little body positivity needs to come in a little bit more. Because if you start saying to yourself, okay, I've, it's not that I've only lost X amount, you need to say, I can't believe I'm, I've lost X amount. Well done. Because the more you are positive to yourself and you big yourself up, the more you're going to want to do it because you're proud of yourself and you keep adding it, it compounds up. But if you keep being negative to yourself, then you don't want to continue because you're just like, what's the point? That's why I think the process is so important, how you do it. You, you're big on sustainability. We sing from a very similar hymn sheet in terms of the messaging of sustainability and what can you stick to and including foods that you enjoy and training. Like I'm a big believer in the training side of weight loss and fat loss, like building lean muscle tissues that you increase your metabolic rate so you burn more calories while you're resting. That's the long-term secret. It's the weight loss equivalent or fat loss equivalent of making money while you sleep. And a lot of females in particular don't always understand that the same as the increasing the calories which I, I agree with you completely as somebody that used to do one-to-one -one personal training I always found it more difficult with my leaner girls to increase their calories than my girls who were heavier on the scale to reduce them because they would normally felt better with a reduction in calories and an increase in fiber you had to completely flip some of my leaner females perspective in terms of look you're not going to get fat if we increase your calories by 200 calories this week it's going to be fine like if anything you might lose more body fat because your energy levels will go up, hormones might be more balanced and we'll do that and increase that gradually over time. So there's so much in between. I want to touch on food and the nutrition side because this is huge, Sarah. And you did a video and a reel that I think went viral. A lot of your stuff goes viral now because there's so much value in there. And again, your humor comes across in the reels as well, which is always helpful. But it was eating healthy but not losing weight. This is a, a very... It should sound like a one word answer, but it's actually quite a nuanced thing because a lot of people have that. I'm eating quote unquote healthy. I'm using inverted commas here because healthy is such a subjective term. You ask a hundred different people, you get a hundred different answers. Talk to us a little bit about those who are listening who are not losing weight, but they're quote unquote eating healthy. Yeah. So I am by no means saying that everyone needs to track calories because it can actually become obsessive for some people. And that's the, that's the side of people that shouldn't be doing that. And there's so many other forms of losing weight without tracking calories. But for a very long period of time, when I was trying to lose weight, I wasn't tracking calories. I didn't really understand calories or macros. It was a complete minefield to me. So I just started eating healthy is what I thought. So, you know, I was having eggs and avocado. I was having um, 
you know, smoothie bowls, acai bowls, all of these. And I just still wasn't losing weight. I was having peanut butter, granola, etc. And I still wasn't losing weight. And I just was not understanding why, because I was still eating healthy or I was now eating healthy. And it was then when I obviously became a coach and started charting calories and coaching women that so many people will eat quote unquote healthy. So, you know, more unsaturated fats, complex carbs, etc., which is fantastic from a health perspective. And I'm not demonizing any food at all, but so many people can have smoothie bowls, etc. Um, and all of these can be really high in calories. So while you don't want to, you know, have every meal that's really low in calories and you're absolutely ravenous and starving, you should have a balance. But when you start tracking calories, you can realize that that video I showed two oat bowls, one bowl of oats ha- was made with water. I-, I got so much hate for that, but I actually, even in a gating phase, I was on 3,500 calories at one stage a couple of months ago and I was still making it with water. I just don't like milky oats. But anyway, that's for another podcast. People are very, very private. Oh, uh, oh they feel strongly about their oats. I'm the same though. Like I do love my oats, but yeah, pe- people feel very strongly about their opinion of how it should be eaten. <laughs> Yeah. Um, So I made one with water and then it was, you know, a lot of volume fruit. So lower calorie volume fruit like berries, strawberries, blackberries, etc. Some chia seeds. I still had some granola on there. I had peanut butter powder instead of peanut butter. Now, personally, even I'm in a dieting phase at the moment and I still prefer my peanut butter. I'm never going to give that up for anyone. So I wasn't saying you have to have these foods. I was just showing little changes. That bowl was, you know, it was big and it was 350 calories. Then my other bowl I made with milk banana, more peanut butter, more granola. And it looked the same size, but that one was 1,200 calories. So it was just showing people that you could be eating something that you think is healthy, but it could still be bringing you into a surplus of Mm -hmm. calories, meaning it can become extremely frustrating. I say this to clients all the time, if they are tracking and they'll use like a cup or they will, you know, track at the end of the day, but sure, I can't even remember what I had for breakfast before this podcast. And It can get very frustrating. You could be four or five weeks, quote unquote, dieting and, you know, you're not seeing changes. You're getting frustrated. You give up, but you weren't actually dieting. So it's it's just trying to understand that if you are dieting, it should be for a period of a smaller period of time. It shouldn't be for a year. It shouldn't be for six months for some people. I just you're clinically obese is slightly different, but for the majority of people, 100 percent. Yeah. You know, even at the moment, I was doing 12 weeks and I'll be honest, I struggled with that for about two, three weeks. I went abroad for two weekends um, out of the last 10 weeks and I've kind of been like, oh God, I, I struggled with that length of time. So clients don't understand that. Clients think, oh, I've been dieting for two years and I'm not seeing results. It can be very hard for them to understand. But they haven't been dieting. They, if they haven't been losing weight, they haven't been dieting. And the quicker they learn that, then they can then start to see changes and do it in a shorter period of time to then go to maintenance. I try and push on, not push, but I try to educate women that, you know, we don't need to diet to see changes all the time. Dieting, but then come out of it. The best stage ever is maintenance, you know? And we also don't, I try as well to explain, we don't have to do phases. You know, I just did a gaining phase and I did that really to show women about bringing up calories and not being afraid and building muscle and how I didn't look drastically different. I gained 11 kg and I didn't look drastically different. And I'm just trying to show the benefits of it. I kind of use myself as a little bit of research now for everyone else to, you know, explain things. And with that, it was the amount of women that were like, oh my God, Sarah, I now realize I don't need to be on 1500 calories. And that makes me sleep happier at night because if I, I feel when I help someone that says that, I'm helping me years ago when I lost a lot of weight. I love that. And again, it's, it's such an important work that you're doing. And again, the it'll, it'll amplified with the podcast here. Anytime anyone comes to me, unless they're an eight-year-old girl, which isn't the clientele I serve, my daughter's age, they shouldn't be on 1,200 calories. And I've regularly had adult women come to me and going, I'm eating at 1200 calories and then they'll sign up for my program or with a coach and they'll be freaking out. I'm like, look, you need to reverse diet out before you even consider getting body fat down. I'm like, you can't go anywhere else at 1200 calories, really. Like, what are you going to do? Go below a thousand calories per day? And, you know, you completely destroy your metabolism if you do that over an extended period of time. And it's so important that people understand, like what you mentioned there, you don't have to have phases 
but you can if it's supportive to you and the way you think and that maintenance should always be the goal that, that you can dip in and out you're going on holidays in four weeks amazing drop into a deficit and go into a cut or into a dieting phase it's Christmas or you know you have a period where you'd like to get a bit stronger a bit more muscly cool you go into a gaining phase or a bulking phase and you can jump between these things or stay at maintenance for the long period again if it's sustainable for you and it's what you can stick to so important that message yeah, and just while, before I forget it, if any women are listening, just because I mentioned there about, you know, dark chocolate, avocado, all of these foods, I really want to make sure that women know even when dieting, they should be added into your diet, especially from a hormonal standpoint. If women are dropping fats really low, I, I made a video about this, actually, it, it'll be posted by the time this podcast goes out. Um, and it's about how important fats are. I'm dieting at the moment and I'm by no means low, low calories, but I'm lower than I was. And for me in the morning, I have quite a good bit of peanut butter and then straight away I'll have dark chocolate. And one, my cognitive function is fantastic in the morning. Two, I'm not really hungry till about three or four o'clock because I've had fats. Mm -hmm. If I don't have fats in my breakfast, I'm ravenous straight after. Um, and then also from a hormonal standpoint, if women are dropping their fats really low, you are you are at the risk of imbalancing your hormones and, you know, that can lead to infertility, losing your period. And that is just a, really something that I want women to understand. If you are trying to go lower calorie, you're more than likely plumbing your fats. And even if you're not going lower calorie, but think oh, fats are bad. I even said it in my video, fats need a different name because, because people just think fat equals I get fat. Yeah. That's not. That's not how it works. So yeah. I know that video was explaining, you know, reduced calories and that fats can bring up calories. That video is, is just showing calories for someone who is needing or wanting to lose some weight. But you should absolutely be still adding in fats. I love that. It's funny because the technical term is that a post tissue for fat and dietary fat is dietary fat. But when it all gets labeled the same and people don't differentiate in the normal terms when I, I like keeping things simple. But I think in this case, adding the science as adipose tissue for actual fat on your body might be very useful in this context. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> Sarah, I want to ask about, you mentioned there fats and I did a separate podcast for anyone that has struggled with that HA, that hypothalamic amenorrhea where you lose your period for an extended period of time with Catherine Stewart. This is her um, area of expertise. So I'll link that in the description for people because that is a very, I won't say complicated but can feel like a minefield to try and navigate through, especially if you haven't had a period in an extended duration of time, months, even years for some females. Um, so I'll link that below. But you mentioned there about the dietary fat and balancing out the hormones and the satiation impacts. Those two things are so important for females, but for men as well. Like Again, a lot of men forget that, you know, things like dietary fat help hormonal ban balance for testosterone as well. So it's not just a one-sided coin for females. But with nutrition in particular and you can go a few different directions and we've covered a few things in terms of the mistakes you've made yourself but knowing everything you know now and you mentioned the younger version of you earlier and you're effectively serving that community now and every time you help somebody it's basically going back to a younger version of you but with the food side of things and the nutrition or even the dieting side there and if, again if you want to extend this into a different area you can What's something that you know now that's very obvious to you that just wasn't obvious back when you were starting out first? First thing that comes to mind is we went traveling five years ago, I think it was, and we went with a group of friends for two weeks and then myself and Anto continued on for three months around Asia. And previous to that was my first big dieting phase. That's when I lost like um, I had lost a little bit and then I'd lost about eight or nine kg. So in total, it was the 13. You know, I went away feeling incredible. But looking back on that holiday, I just wish I could do it all again because I actually remember sitting in a restaurant and I was hiding my phone underneath the table in front of Anto. I've been with Anto 11 years. So it's not like, you know, we were together just a couple of months. I was hiding my phone underneath the table on my fitness pal. And I was on holiday. I was traveling and... You know, I was, I was lean. I didn't need to be tracking at that moment of time. If anything, I could have done with gaining a little bit of weight. But that's why I'm so, I re, I just love to coach ladies now in the eight week challenges. They come in and they'll say, right, eight weeks, I am not doing this and I'm not doing that. I'm not going on holiday and I'm not going out in the weekends. And I'm like, no, plan something. I want you to, I want you to plan something now, whether it's a date night, whatever it is, because you should be able to, and don't get me wrong, like, 
there's times in a dieting phase where you do have to be a little bit more um, strategic. But my eight week challenges are to build a lifestyle. They are blocks, but you know, women might do three or four or five a year. And it's just showing that a holiday or going abroad or whatever it is, is once in a blue moon for a lot of people. It, or it could be once a year for a lot of people that it's a drop in the ocean it's something to be enjoyed and I made a video the other day about I always used to say food is fuel and it's, that's what I always thought and it is I you know went for a 13k the other day and that was on top of all of my stuff that I'm doing for my dieting phase at the moment and I said you know what I don't want to feel horrendous on Monday I'm going to have more calories today because I need more so that's where food is fuel but food is also time of celebration, social event. It's also culture. If you go abroad, you want to try new food. It is also um, a part of your relationship that you might go out and enjoy some food. And food should be seen as pleasure at times and not just fuel, not just calories and not just macros because that's when you start to lose experiences you know, we go abroad on holiday and now I get to enjoy a lot more food and I don't even think of the calories. I think of when I think back to eating that food, like for instance, now I'm just thinking of like a massive donut that we get in Universal Studios. Like that to me is just like the laughs we had that day, you know, the how funny it was, how big it was and etc. Whereas when I think back to Asia, I think of me with the phone underneath the table and I don't even remember what was on the plate or the conversation I had at that time. So it's just knowing that yes, food can be fuel, but remember that it's so much more than that and that you live one life and you can be healthy, enjoy food and feel amazing. You don't have to let it consume you. And if you are at a stage right now that it's consuming you, there is help out there for you to be able to get past that stage. Yeah, I love that, Sarah. Like food freedom is such a unspoken about topic for those who are struggling that, as you mentioned, hiding your phone underneath a, a dinner table and tracking calories, secret tracking. And that, when you think you get one life to live, isn't the way that you want to navigate through. And this might be a wake up call for a lot of people. So I'm very glad we're having this conversation. I obviously will link the eight week challenges in the link below as well for people to click on those. And there's the app for the other times in the year. So people could be served all the way through. Talk to us about supplements then. And we'll keep it kind of fat loss, weight loss specific because you have a free supplement guide on the website also that I'll link in the description below. Talk to us about the role they play because supplements are I have such a love-hate relationship with them personally because I think they're amazing I think they work great they don't come with the cost of a nutrition change and food changes which is where the problem comes in where people think the supplement will do all the work but they can massively supplement whatever goal you're trying to hit talk to us a little bit about the role supplement plays with weight loss and some of your preferred ones to consider for the majority of people who are looking to lose weight yeah so I always say, and this was not my own analogy, I actually heard it in a podcast years ago from James Smith and I still use it to this day. Supplements is like baking a cake. So it's it's like getting your cherry and making your icing first before baking the cake. It doesn't make sense. It's not going to it's not going to be useful. So you need to bake the cake first, which is your nutrition and your training and focus on that. There's no point taking supplements if you are lying on the couch horizontal all day on TikTok. That is the first thing I'll say because I did it and I don't mind saying it now. I remember I ordered a, I can't even remember what it was. It was some stack. I actually still think they're being sold. I got on Amazon. This was years and years ago and I was taking fat loss tablets and I was also taking a fat loss, uh, a fat burner. This was years ago and one, they're so expensive. Two, I remember I took it one day and these fat burners are basically just extreme caffeine and they reduce your appetite well it didn't even just reduce my appetite it made me so sick that I was on a train into college and I threw up all over the train and I now tell clients this because I'm it's not that I'm trying to well I, I am trying to scare monger about fat supplements because you don't need them but also they're they're just making you feel sick so if I'm any experience there to say that you know why would my body be rejecting something because it it didn't want it there. So that is one thing that I most certainly don't recommend. In terms of if you are focusing on your health, your nutrition and everything's kind of 
in line, then supplements can be absolutely incredible. One supplement that I recommend to everyone, and I mean, you know, 16 year olds training um, GA, 80 year old that isn't in the gym is creatine. Creatine, you're always going to benefit from. I even have my parents taking it. They're not gym goers. Creatine is naturally made in the body before anyone thinks it's a stair, like a, a supplement that, you know, is illegal or anything. It's absolutely not. Um, a lot of people get worried that, oh, is it, am I taking too many? I actually got my bloods done two weeks ago and I've been taking creatine now for seven years and my creatine is perfect balance. You know, it's not too high and I just got my bloods done. So, you know, it is naturally made, but we don't make enough of it. Therefore, we need to supplement it. There is so many benefits for creatine. It's not just for people in the gym. It can help with your endurance, your endurance, your performance, your strength. But it also helps, as I said, like an 80 year old, if they default, it helps with your bone mass, your bone density. So it can reduce breaks when you have a trip or a fall. It can help with your cognitive function, brain health, etc. So do have a look at that. As, I, as you said, I do have a supplement guide there. And then protein as well. Protein is one of the macronutrients that we want to hit, protein, fats and carbs, but protein is very difficult. I know, you know, I have some females that are on recommended 170 grams of protein and I'll reduce that for the time being for them to build it up over time because it can be a scary amount to hit. If you're struggling to hit your protein, then a protein supplement would be brilliant. There's so many out there now, like a clear way, even just as like a juice to drink. You can pop it in oats, whatever. So they're the two that I only really push. And then I always say, go get your bloods done because everyone is so different. So many people go out and they buy X, Y, Z and they're just spending so much money. I was taking vitamin B12 for so long, got my bloods done. Mine was sky high. I didn't need it. So th- th- you're going to save money if you get your bloods done to see what you actually need. You might need many. So it's, everyone's going to be different, unfortunately, with, with supplements. Yeah, and that vitamin B12, with the exception of anyone that's plant-based or vegan where you're not eating red meat, it's probably the only, what you do because your body doesn't store vitamin B12 as well. Literally, if you're not getting it from food and nutrition or supplement, your body can't make it by itself. So vegans and, and plant-based individuals have to take it. Yeah. The majority of plant eaters or carnivores generally don't need it so it's interesting that you got the bloods and it was high probably sky high because if you're a meat eater it's going to be way higher than normal so you're literally just urinating or peeing out the excess and it's just you know, again it's funny um with supplements what are your thoughts and this is just me being curious because i have such a with a multivitamin because this seems to be coming into my space i was asked about this like four times this week and i never touch or t- talk about multivitamins i think they're a bit of a shotgun approach they're like again, some people love them. They think it covers all the bases. I'm probably on the side that it's a bit of a jack of all trades, master of none. You should get your bloods done and pick individual supplements you need. What's your thought on a multivitamin? Yeah, I would I would completely agree with you there. But one thing that a lot of people do, um, I work with my protein, so I'm not bashing, uh, you know, supplement companies. But a lot of supplement com- companies have brought out, you know, gummies and all of these. I I. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, maybe Little and Aldi have ones. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but there is a lot of shops that will bring them out and in a cheaper version. So they'll have a lot of bulking agents in them. And to be honest, you look at the ingredient list at the back and what is in the multivitamin is halfway down the list. So you just have to be quite careful because yes, they might be cheaper, but you might need everything that's in it. Therefore, it might be half the price for you to buy, let's say, vitamin D and uh, vitamin B if you if you just wanted those two so they can be great uh, one that I do always recommend the the brand is Nutri Advanced that's a very good brand but otherwise I, I don't love them because I do think a lot of them are just filled with bulking agents yeah I'm not a massive fan either and my protein are a great brand as well that's actually I make up my own pre-workout supplement just with beta alanine and creatine and AAKG and stuff from my protein so yeah, and again, I have no affiliation with them, so I'm happy to say that they're a, a good place for people to go to look into. I think you probably have a code and stuff, which I'll also link. Again, show notes galore for yeah, today's podcast. Yeah, this is <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, got, got you covered. Sarah, you mentioned there, we obviously touched on the cherry and icing as the supplements and the cake being the nutrition and training. Do you find, and this seems to split people down the middle, because if you're a good sleeper, 
You tend to not have an issue with this at all. And it's automatic. If you're a poor sleeper, it feels like everything else in life is difficult because yeah. you're not sleeping well. What role do you think sleep and recovery plays then on top of the nutrition and training? If we're talking that metaphorical cake and then the supplements being the icing on top, what role does it play in terms of your experience with yourself and your personal journey alongside all the women you've helped over the years? You know, this actually probably ties into when you said earlier, what is something you've learned that, you know, you wish you knew years ago? I just thought sleep, well, you know, you don't need sleep. You know, especially when I started my coaching business, I was like, I need to be up till two o'clock in the morning, work on the laptop. That's where the grind is, up at 5 a.m. I now just couldn't focus on my sleep anymore. I probably focus on it a little bit too much. I mean, I I'm, love my aura ring and every day I'm like, how much sleep do I get? Which I don't also recommend because you can get obsessed with these trackers and sometimes they, they didn't even track it properly. Or they'll say your recovery is low, yet you've woken up feeling absolutely incredible. But you're like, ah, oh, won't go to the gym today. And vice versa. You wake up feeling terrible and it says you're amazing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but sleep is something that again my clients if they're listening to this they will know that often I've had women say oh I'm not sleeping well blah 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 blah. and I'll say okay well where's your phone in the evening I only I only literally 10 minutes I'm scrolling I will not listen to someone that says they struggle with their sleep if they're in bed on TikTok or scrolling I just won't let because your phone it was actually my coach that said this to me and if my parents are listening I do apologize but your, the room should be focused, your bed should be focused on sleep and sex. The two X, S's, no phone in there, nothing. And if you're single, maybe not, but if, if you... <laughs> yeah, yeah, it works, works slightly differently, but yeah, yeah, but still, still, single people but, have a lot of sex as well. Exactly, yeah. Just your phone should not be in the room and it shouldn't, even if it's beside you, pop it on the other side of the, of the room if you need an alarm, that's perfect. If anything, it'll get you up in the morning to go across the, the room to get it. But if you are not focusing on your sleep, you are going to struggle massively in a deficit because you're going to get up, you're going to be hungry, you are going to be craving, your cravings are going to be much higher. Who wakes up tired and wants to grab a salad or make meal prep? No one does. Now, I always get very on the fence talking about sleep because ha- it's so important. It should be focused on. If it's not focused on, you're going to struggle in your deficit. You're also going to struggle with recovery. If you're not recovering, you're not going to be building muscle. If you're not recovering, you're not going to be able to push harder in your sessions. You know, it it's so important. But also, I have so many clients that are night shift workers, moms, um, you know, newborn babies. And I don't want them to feel like you literally can't see any changes or women going through perimenopause, menopause that are having night sweats and they think, oh, you know, Sarah said it's only if you sleep well, you'll see results. You can absolutely still see results. You ladies are not in the small circle there that I was talking about sleep or scrolling on TikTok. You know, you have to focus on what you can control. And if that's getting a nap or sleep wherever you can, then doing what you can is best. So if your sleep's not great, well, then you need to see, okay, well, what can I do to help that? Little things like even buying um, in Ireland, I miss them so much, like the fit food meals and all of the prepep meals. They could be so handy, not cheap, but handy to throw in your freezer. And in a time of maybe, you know, you're busy with the kids or whatever it is, you throw that into the microwave. And that is one thing that has helped you not grab something on the go because you've just been exhausted. That you know, no one's life is going to be perfect. And while we can say sleep needs to be focused on, yes, it does if you have the ability to do that, but just not everyone does. If you don't, all is not lost and you're at a period of time in your life that it might be reduced a little bit and changes might be a little bit slower. But again, it's a period of time in your life. And this is something Sorry, this is off track, but I think this is a really good topic of lockdown. I get so many people at the moment in the last year saying, I can't see changes as much as I did in lockdown. I'm not seeing as much results as I did in lockdown. And I'm like, yes, because you were probably at home. You had so much more time to train. You had so much more time to go for walks. It was almost like we were running out of prison and going for walks. So, so many more people wanted to do it. Now it's not that sexy. We're all back able to walk wherever we want. It's not that fun. So you need to always look at where are you in your life right now? And maybe it's different to where you were previous. 
Yeah, that's really important because your starting point matters greatly. But I also want to just add on to the sleep there because there is a misconception and I'm probably sometimes a proponent, a misguided proponent of this because I, I'm always shouting the benefits of sleep. Sleep with weight loss and fat loss won't inhibit your progress. It just makes it feel so much more difficult. What sleep does is it makes everything feel easier. It makes food choices feel easier because your hormonal balance is going to be more in line with your ghrelin, your leptin, your hunger, your satiation hormones. Your energy is potentially going to be higher, so your workouts will be better. And if your workouts are better, you will either burn more calories if it's a cardiovascular session or you'll lift more weight or you'll increase your metabolic rate through that resistance training. And all of that will feel easier and it'll snowball positively. It doesn't mean you can't. I remember competing, getting really lean for fitness model shows, bodybuilding shows on three hours of sleep, four hours of sleep. Now I had more fat burners and fat burning drugs to knock a baby or an osteris, but it worked and I was able to get there. I'm not recommending that. It's actually the opposite of what I recommend people do. But sometimes when you have females who are perimenopausal or even menopausal or new parents, they can think that, well, I'm just not going to get any results now because I'm not sleeping. That's not true. It just makes everything feel more difficult. Yes. Sarah, the last question that I want to ask, and before I do that, we obviously I'm going to link up the app I'll link up the Instagram page the TikTok social media is there anywhere in particular you want to send people it'll all be in the show notes before we get into the last question yeah if people want to find me I suppose I'm most active on Instagram and from there you'll be able to see everything about my app so my app is a monthly subscription and that's just because my eight week challenges were constantly selling out very quickly that I just wanted um, also a cheaper service. It's much cheaper because there isn't weekly check-ins, but you get your workouts and your calories, your macros, etc. And then I have Nate me challenges that you work with me and the team weekly. So they're my two coaching services. And then everything else is going to be on Instagram that you can find me. Amazing. I like everything that we talked about in today's podcast in the show notes on brightkeyfitness.com and in the description below. Sarah, the last thing I want to ask, and you can go in any direction on this because we've covered a little bit of it, but one of your big focuses and one of your messages is losing weight without restriction. And with calorie control and food, there's always going to be a little bit of an element of restriction in some capacity, whether that's changing food choices or less food, etc. But if you said to somebody who's asking, I want to lose weight without restriction, what would be the bottom of the pyramid of prioritization? What would be the first thing you would get them to look at if they think, right, I've yo-yo dieted, I've been doing way too extreme in terms of my calorie cutting, I've been dieting, quote unquote, for two years, like we talked about earlier, where in reality they haven't been, but a lot of people will convince themselves because of, in their mind, they're dieting, and that's a very positive, or um, that can be a very negative story in reality to live in, especially if you're not controlling your calories and you're you're not actually dieting. That can be really frustrating because you think you're doing everything right when in reality you're not. Talk to us about losing weight without restriction and what would be at the bottom of that pyramid for somebody in that position. I suppose the very first thing, the bottom, is going to be how you look at the next coming weeks. So if you think of a ladder, how are you going to get to the top of the ladder? Are you going to jump up with not touching all the little steps? No, you're, you're going to have to go step by step to get to the top of the ladder. And that's how I try and help women who are genuinely just at rock bottom and they don't know where to go. Because if you do absolutely everything, again, I actually have a video coming about this. If you go 100%, then more than likely you're going to fall off. And being 80% consistent is better than 100% not consistent or inconsistent. Um, So the first thing that I would say is instead of sacrificing, make compromises, small little changes. So for instance, you know, if someone says I'm going for a social event, will I reduce calories really, really low for the whole week and then have my social event? I'm like, well, no, we can pull down a little bit, but instead of your cocktails or your wine and beer, why don't we have a spirit and a zero calorie mixer? You know, it's, it's instead of then people are like, oh shit, Sarah's not making me cut out alcohol. And it's treating people like an adult rather than they come to the weekend, they're like a five-year-old at a birthday party because they've been told. I always say this, like I used to see kids in school and their parents wouldn't allow them chocolate. And then you see those kids at the birthday party and they were actually just like a starfish on the table with eating absolutely everything because they know that when they go home, their parents are going to go back to gluten-free and dairy-free. And it like that's I actually I can picture it, whereas, you know, so many people that are given chocolate and sweets when they're younger, they're not really that bothered. They go and play with the rest of the kids. 
So it's just trying to not restrict and go 100% in because that's never, it's never going to work. And you're only going to be much longer trying to do that. Also goes the same with training. People will say, right, I've started six training sessions. And I'm like, cool, how many were you doing before? Well, I wasn't doing any. Okay, well, let's do three. People are like, no, that's not enough. Well, it's three more than you were doing. And when people start to see results and they enjoy what they're doing, they then might add a little bit more. So yes, right now it doesn't sound that you're going to get a lot of results starting off slow, but you're actually going to get a lot more results long term. 100%. What an amazing way to finish. And I laughed because that is so true for the birthday party analogy. But also, you if you were coming up to the weekend like a five-year-old who's never had chocolate in their home house, it means you need to reevaluate the way you're looking at your nutrition and your food plan. I think that's a great check-in for people because you have a few people who laughed and then they probably stopped because they're like, oh, no, yeah. that's me. <laughs> yeah. Which is always good. That's what we try and activate and trigger on this podcast because awareness is the first step towards change. Sarah, absolutely love this conversation. I think you're doing incredible work online. I've got Anto, who I'm working with a little bit now. He's coming through one of my courses online. So I'm looking forward to seeing what he'll be doing as well. So he'll be an absolute powerful tag team over the, the coming years. Um, as I mentioned, I will link everything in the show notes for those who aren't following you on social, show, social. Go check out the Instagram, particularly off the back of this. And the app will be linked there and in the show notes and the coaching programs, the eight week challenges that you run. Sarah, keep doing what you're doing. And thank you so much again. Brian, thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. That was fat loss coach Sarah Catterson on dieting phases, losing weight without restriction and the power of making compromises, not sacrifices. Hopefully you enjoyed today's podcast. If you did and you haven't left a rating or a review, if you listen on Spotify, if you can leave a rating, a five-star rating would be amazing, especially if you got a lot of value from today's episode. Or if you listen on Apple Podcasts, you can leave a rating and a review so you can go a little bit more in detail to what you like about today's episode or any of the previous episodes. I read them all and use it to gauge feedback on what guests to bring on in the future or repeated guests. It also helps massively with the growth of the show so that I can bring awesome people like Sarah on to help you with your journey. That's everything from me from today's podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Catch you all next week. 